Okay, welcome. Uh, this is Dr. Morton, uh, Logic Design, and this is for uh, Friday the 9th of October. Um, so today I'm going to, uh, I, I did finish Unit 9 uh, on Wednesday, but I'll, I'll just kind of review a few things and uh, uh, just kind of go over a few things again. Uh, in addition to that, I will talk a little bit about the, the Queenie McCluskey quiz that you need to do today. Um, and I, I don't think I'll make a quiz to go with this uh, lecture because of that. Um, what I do recommend you do, if you, if you go on the website, let me shrink this down, uh, and you look. So here's, here's what's due this week. Um, so we'll finish unit, well, we already finished unit 9, but we'll review Quinn McCluskey and uh, finish unit 9. Uh, and then you uh, should continue to work on your homework. If you... If you haven't uh, been communicating with your project team, make sure you go on Blackboard, find your team members, and connect with them. Uh, if your team reaches out to you and you don't respond, uh, <clears throat> then you're going to lose you're going to lose five percent of your course grade because you're not participating in the project. So you do need to you do need to kick in. And I have had there have been several groups that have uh, that have uh, reached out to me and said. Uh, some of the members are not responding to any of their emails or, or texts or anything. All right, so that's the syllabus. Uh, so you do need to, the homework's due on the 12th next week. So you do need to uh, uh, do the Queenie McCluskey quiz today. So on the, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, I do need to do that. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to update that. All right, so uh, if you look at the uh, the lectures you, you, that are recorded, the videos, you'll see the video 13 and 14 cover Queenie McCluskey. Uh, the first part, 13, and the second part. Basically, for the first part is just the standard Queenie McCluskey without a don't without any don't cares, and then the second half is with the don't cares. So uh, you probably could just look at the second half one, and that would probably do it for you. So make sure you. Make sure you review those lectures before you do the test, and that will stand you in good stead. Now, um, I'll show you just a little bit about the test. Let's see, uh, where are we here? Why, why can't I see what's, okay, looked funny. So if I go into the course content, and I scroll down here, and uh, so here's the QM quiz, uh, which you can see that, but you can't see these files yet. They'll, they'll pop up. Uh, but here's the worksheet. So, uh, and here it is. Yeah, so we'll put this one down. All right, so uh, you have to enable editing, and then you should be able to see it. Uh, so I gave you part of the problem, but I haven't finished it all. You have to actually start the test to see all the min terms and all the don't cares, so so I so uh, so without knowing all the min terms and all the don't cares, you can't really start working on it, and so therefore uh, uh, you 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 won't really see the the entire problem till you start the quiz, and it's in the instructions. So, but then remember, first you you have to group them according to the number of ones, and then you compare group zero with group one and uh, put anything that combines over here and now you have a you have two boxes combined so you you go from a four variable problem to a three variable term or a four variable term to a three variable term when you use them be sure and check them off then you compare group one with anything in group two and then all group two with group three and group three with group four and you then have a new column with zero ones one one two ones and three ones um, and then uh, you go through these to see if any of these can combine and you you may very well wind up with some uh, groups that have uh, a group of four boxes joined together uh, and any group of four always has to be done two different ways so if you get a group of four you should have another group of four that's got the exact same term the that's the exact same uh, actual uh, term but uh, it'll have the same min terms in it and it'll have the same, um, you know, like like it like AD or AC or BD or whatever. 
it'll be that will be the same but the way but but the order of the min terms will be slightly different so you just cross out one of those because you only need one you don't need the, the duplicates because there's always two ways to put together a group of four and uh, and then you'll have some terms here you'll have some terms that are um, are, ne are not combined with anything over here and so you'll take and then none of these terms over here can be combined to a group of eight so then you'll wind up with uh, some groups of two uh, some, some terms with two variables which constitute a group of four or four min terms and you'll have some groups of uh, 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 where you uh, where you have three variable terms uh, where you've grouped two boxes together so you have two min terms and you write all of your prime implicates down here in this column all the min terms involved in the prime implicate and what you should write down here is the actual expression uh, don't write you know 0 1 1 dash or something like that write write in you know a prime b c or whatever the term is and then put in the min terms and then you uh, then you check all the min terms for each of these prime implicates that are uh, covered with the prime implicate now you'll notice that uh, that uh, the that there 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 will be don't cares I've kind of helped you out a little bit remember you do not put the don't cares at the top here okay just the required min terms so anyway so so uh, once you get this all done uh, then you can start the you can actually uh, start answering questions in the quiz uh, remember you can't back up so do the questions one at a time don't back up uh, well you can't back up and once you start it the quiz will upload in 90 minutes so while you're working on this sheet uh, doing this uh, you're using up part of your 90 minutes so make sure that you're efficient and you get this done so you still have time left to answer the questions and uh, and then when you uh, when you answer the questions uh, then there'll be questions about uh, uh, if you have any uh, terms that have two variables in them uh, pick pick out of the various ones listed pick any that that uh, are two variable terms and then if you have any three variable terms pick any pick pick all the ones that are that are uh, that are in your solution and then uh, then specify what the don't cares are uh, and then I forget so one other question so there's just a few questions um, you should be able to this this should be pretty straightforward if you filled out that sheet then you should be uh, you shouldn't have any trouble at all doing the quiz and again, if you look at those two lectures again, you should be all you should be all set to go. Just work carefully. Don't panic. You've got 90 minutes to do it, so you should be fine. Okay. Um, so let's let's pull up the slides. I don't think I uh, I don't think I did that. Oh, maybe I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. So here we go. Okay, so unit nine, we've already been through this once. I'm just going to talk about it kind of, I'm just going to hit the highlights. So this won't be a particularly long uh, uh, lecture. All right, so, so we covered multiplexers, three-state buffers or tri-state buffers, decoders and encoders, read-only memories. And then we talked some about programmable logic devices and a little bit about Shannon's uh, decomposition or Shannon's expansion. Um, so remember the multiplexers. So these are these are very very useful devices, and they do show up all the time. So uh, it's good to, to know about them. So the they consist of some number of inputs, and it's almost always a power of two. Some number of control lines, and the number of input is that if you have uh, n control lines then you're going to have two to the n inputs. So we have a and b, so that's two control lines, so n is two. Two squared is four, so we have four inputs. If you have three control lines, you have eight. If you have four, you have 16, and so forth. Multiplexers with a whole lot bigger than 16 are kind of rare. Uh, and you should remember that any four to one multiplexer can implement, or any four to one multiplexer can impl implement any three variable problem any arbitrary three variable truth table can be implemented with this multiplexer and we talked about how to do that I'll review that in just a second so here's the generic 2 to the n to 1 you have n control lines you have 2 to the n uh, inputs 
and only one output F. Here's one way you can implement these in hardware. Obviously, there's many ways you can do it, but this is one. You could do it in SOP, POS, NAN, NAN, NOR, NOR. There's a whole bunch of ways it can be done. Um, okay, and we have a whole bunch of different ones. All right, so how do you implement any uh, three variable uh, problem or any three variable truth table with a four to one MUX? Well, it's pretty straightforward. So the first thing you do is you recognize that your two higher order variables, in this case, uh, A is our higher order variable, C is our lower order. So C is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then B is 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then C is 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So the lower order variable changes with every row. The higher order variables uh, are a little more stable. Notice if you divide this into pairs of rows, every pair of rows has the same high order variables of A and B. For this pair, A and, A and B are both zero, or A prime, B prime. For this pair of rows, it's A prime, B. For this, it's A, B prime, and for this, it's A, B. So what that means is then, your control lines are the same for this pair of rows, which, which means that both of those pairs of rows are, are going to be represented by, the, by I zero, the first input. The next pair of rows, uh, is going to relate to I1, the next relate to I2, the next relate to I3. And so if you want to generate F, you just have to look and see, well, what is F for the pair of rows? If, say, it's one for both rows, then you can put the constant in on that line. In this case, uh, I3, you just make I3 a constant one. Here, I2 is a constant zero, right there. And then notice, uh, what do you do when you have F is one? for the first row and zero for the second row. Well, you you have one other option and that is C. Notice that F if, if F is one and zero or zero and one, then it's either gonna be C or C prime. So you can put, in this case, it's opposite of C, so it's C prime or it's bar C or whatever you wanna call it. So so we uh, so we put the inverse of C into, into I zero, the inverse of C into I one, because it's the same, and then zero into I2 and 1 and I3. And now we've completely reproduced this truth table uh, using this 4 to 1 multiplexer. Remember, you do have to hook your A and B variables up to your control inputs. So there you are. And there is another way to do this using uh, K maps and stuff. I, I encourage you not to pay attention to that. I don't think it's, I think it's more confusing than it is helpful. So, um, three state buffers. These are used extensively. They come in four flavors, right? You have an input A and an output C, and in some cases the output C is the inverse of A, and in some cases it's the same as A. So you have non-inverting and inverting types of, of, of tri-state buffers or three-state buffers. Now the other input you have to this gate is, is the B input, and the B input is a control line that basically uh, uh, controls whether the buffer is working, active, and passing A through to C, or inverting it to C in the case of the inverting ones, or whether this tri-state buffer is in what's called a high Z state, where it's essentially disconnected. So in that case, A does not drive C anymore. C is just out there floating, disconnected from A completely. And we use these frequently in cases where we have more than one output trying to drive the same line. And we need to make sure only one of those outputs is actually connected at any given time. Because remember in the digital world, uh, our, our, almost our, the outputs from our gates are either zeros or ones. They're, they're never like nothing. This is the only way you can cause an output to be disconnected, to use this tri-state buffer and disconnect it, put it in a high Z state. So that's, that's what they're used for. They're used extensively. They're very important building blocks in our logic, uh, in, in our uh, toolbox of logic uh, gates. And these, these are used extensively. So when we talk about the, the, the control input here, B, we talk about whether it's active or inactive. And some of these are active high, like in this case, this B here is active high. So when B is a one, it turns on the buffer, and A equals C will be this equal to A. 
if it's inactive, when B is zero, then C is disconnected from A and it's in what's called the high Z state. Just like you had to just clip the line. If it has a bubble, like here, then we call it at, then we call it an active low uh, control, and an active low control, it, when it's when you when it's low, that disconnects A from C again or C from A, however you want to think about that. When B is high, then the buffer is working. Uh, sorry, I, sw I switched that around. When when it's when it's active the A is connected to C. So when B is low, uh, A is connected, C, C will be the same as A. When B is high, then this is no longer true. So it's, so we say, we say in that case that the, the control line or B is deasserted. So it's asserted when it, when it's low in this case, deasserted when it's high. And when it's, uh, asserted, it connects A to C. When it's deasserted, it puts it in a high Z state. So you think of the control line as turning the buffer on or switching it off. If it's off, then A is C will be disconnected from A. All right. So decoders. These are a little, little more confusing to, to sort out, but remember they have three inputs. And we have a chip enable, and then we have, in this case, two to the n outputs, where n is the number of inputs. So three inputs, we get eight outputs. At, given the pattern of our ABC, one of these outputs, and only one, will be turned on. If the chip enable is true, then it'll be a one. If the chip enable is false, it'll be a zero. So that's basically how we how we would pass through a multiplex line. But most of the time, we leave the chip enabled all the time, and we use these as address line decoders. And we uh, daisy chain them together and hook them, and we can eventually break out a whole bunch of address lines this way. Okay, um, and this is the truth table for the decoder. Notice when they're all zeros, y zero is a one. When they're all ones, y seven is a one, and everything in between. But at no time is more than one output high. All right, so I think I'm going to do that. Uh, how can we implement uh, how can we implement any arbitrary uh, expression with this decoder? It's easy. We just have to add an external OR gate, and we pick whatever min terms here we need in our solution. So all we have to do is look at our truth table, see what rows where f is a one, and then we take those those outputs and put them into an OR gate, and that OR gate then drives our final output. So if we're in one that's not going into the R gate, then the R gate will be all zeros and we'll get out a zero. But if any one of the inputs of the R gate lights up, then we get out a one. And that's exactly what you want. Uh, so that's how we implement any logic expression with a decoder, but it does require an external R gate. Okay, and then we have this general, sorry, uh, this general terminology, yeah, for, for decoders. And just remember, you have n control lines. You have two to two to the n outputs, and usually your input, if you're actually using it as at the far end of a multiplexer link, then you would use your chip enable as your actual data inline. Okay, read-only memories. So read-only memories are also extensively used. They're used all over the place. So you do need to know about these. So there. They're made from a number of different technologies, but pretty much these days, you only have to really think about, uh, uh, well, uh, two major kinds, maybe three. There still is a, some uh, use for factory programmed ROMs because they, they can be, you know, in large, large quantities, they can be cheaper than uh, programmable ROMs. So if you're building a product and you're going to use a RAM to a ROM, a read-only memory to decode it, or to implement part of its uh, its its uh, its its electronics, then uh, if you're making you know lots and lots of them, maybe a hundred thousand or so, then you could probably save money by having it factory uh, programmed. Of course, you have to be careful. You don't want to get it factory programmed and have a hundred thousand chips that are wrong. So you do have to be careful about that. But 
other, uh, but if you make it in large numbers, it, it probably will still be cheaper than buying parts that are programmable. But the really nice thing about ROMs is you can program them yourself, and you can change them, and you can reprogram them. Now we have uh, two major types of uh, of, of programmable uh, read-only memories. They're both electrically programmable, electrically erasable read-only memories. And we, we, we call one EEPROM, and we call the other FLASH. But they're really the same. They're, they're the same kind of device. They're just two different technologies to get the same thing. And the FLASH is a little denser, so you can store more in the same amount of space uh, on the chip. And the FLASH, on the other hand, has uh, the disadvantage that you... Uh, that uh, you must erase several cells at once. And a, how, ma how many cells you have to erase at once is, uh, varies depending on the exact flash. But, but you usually cannot just in erase one. You usually have to erase a whole, you know, a whole group of them, maybe eight, m maybe more. Whereas the EE proms, they, uh, you can usually erase each individual location individually. Typically, we use uh, where we see flash used a lot is in jump drives, and we also see it used for program memory on uh, microprocessors, microcontrollers. So, um, so anyway, so those are those are some uh, so, some uses. Now, when you want to specify a ROM, um, you uh, well, this is an example of how you could factory program one. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We'll slip, slip through. Notice that, uh, notice that the, the ROM is basically made up uh, in uh, with two blocks. The one block is your address decoding block. And it uses a lot of those, essentially the same kind of decoder chips, only they're all just on the same die. So they're not discrete chips. They're, they're, but the same concepts are used here to take some number of address lines and turn it into two to the n word lines. So that say if you have three address lines, you'd have eight words if you had four. And and your ROMs can come in pretty big sizes. I mean, uh, you know, something the size of uh, eight kilobytes, 16 kilobytes, 32 kilobytes, those are not unusually large ROMs. So if you see this layout here, then you, you basically can see that that you have the, the memory array over here and your address decoder over here. Now, it, it this little diagram does not include the uh, the circuit the circuitry that allows you to input data into the ROM and program it there there's there are, there's programming there there are features of the ROM that allow you to uh, use the same output lines uh, that's that that's going to be that are going to be used to send data out you can use these same output lines to send data in they're actually bi-directional and there's a there is a pin on the ROM that switches it into a mode where you can program it. There's also another pin that uh, that where you apply a small programming pulse, uh, usually a little higher voltage. Although in the old days it used to be that, that we'd run these at five volts, but when you programmed them, you'd send in a, a maybe a 23 or 24 volt pulse. But we don't do that anymore. Now the the the, the programming voltage is maybe just a volt or so more than the than the the, the running voltage, or maybe not even, maybe not even, maybe it's the same voltage. Um, so, um, so when you specify these ROMs, there's a couple of things you have to specify. One, you want to specify how how many how many words it's going to store and how many bits wide all the words are. So, in this case, you have two to the n word lines. So and you're going and you have M output lines. So those are two specifications. And then obviously, your word lines then are normally a power of two, and N then becomes the number of address lines. Or you do, you take the number of word lines and take the log base two of that and round it up to the nearest number, and that tells you how many address lines you have to have. So you normally specify this this ROM by how big the word is, how many bits in each word. And how many words you have to store, usually a power of two, and then that, then you can take uh, that power of two, that that being n, that would be the number of address lines you have to have, and then usually you have to have power, ground, and uh, a uh, 
a uh, uh, programming input and a programming power input. Now, ROMs are especially useful when you have to whip out a design very quickly or when most input combinations are needed. And there's very, very little sharing of product terms in your output functions. But if you can, if you can, uh, if you if you don't have most input combinations needed, like if you have a lot of don't cares, and you can share terms, uh, then you could do it, you can do it with uh, individual gates and not have to use a ROM, and you're gonna you're gonna save a lot of hardware if you do that. Okay, here's an example of a 2764 EEPROM. Now these were these are kind of legacy parts. But we have similar parts today that are EE proms. Same thing, except they're electrically programmable, electrically erasable. These these 2764 chips actually uh, had the ability to be erased uh, ultra, with ultraviolet light. In fact, let me show you a picture uh, because I'm sure we can find one. Let me do Bing, and we'll do a 2764. E P R O M, and then we'll do the images. M. Let's see. Oh, how come? Yeah, here it is. Well, okay. This is you can buy this on eBay for two bucks. It's a 64K E prom. It's a 2764. It's UV erasable, and notice uh, we can blow it up. You're looking through a little window here. Uh, it's usually a mica window, and you're actually seeing the actual die. Now this is out of focus, unfortunately. Let's see if we can find a better picture. Oh, this is probably better. How come it? Oh well, okay. There you go. Notice you can actually see the bonding wires connected here. That's the actual chip right there. It's on. A, I think it's on a little carrier. But anyway, and if you could blow this up a little more, you would actually see. The uh, you'd actually see the the integrated circuit pattern that's on there. Uh, maybe I'll I, I have some of these. Maybe I'll bring some in and you can pass them around and look. And if you look at them with a microscope, you can you can totally see the die. That's the die. Of course, look at how big the the, the carrier is compared to the actual die size, right? Yeah, I don't know why we're not seeing. Um, and uh, yeah. So we would normally make we normally had a programmer that would look like this. We'd add this zero insertion four socket. You plug it in here and it would program it and then when you wanted to erase it, you would just have a little ultraviolet light you could expose it to for about 15 minutes and uh, and it would erase it. Once you had it programmed, then you would uh, put a little sticker over that window so it wouldn't uh, accidentally erase itself. All right. So uh, now there are some exceptions to this. Uh, I can show you another chip that only has four pins, and it holds maybe 128k, uh, or, or maybe or maybe uh, 128 bytes or whatever. So how can it do that with only maybe uh, you know four pins or eight pins or something like that? And the answer is that some of these will use a different interface. Where, where you actually have a serial interface and you're sending all the signals down through one or two lines. You s send in the address and then the data comes out in serial format. So, so there are other ways of uh, packaging these and, 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 uh, and actually communicating with them. But uh, the, the typical ROM is usually set up with, with all the address lines and all the outputs available. Notice on this one you have, you have uh, output enable, uh, chip select, and you have program, and then you have program power. So when you when you turn on program, then that makes these these outputs inputs. And then when and then when you you put the address in to, on the address lines for the location you want to program, and then you pulse the little program the VPP uh, input. What's not shown on here is power and ground. The standard uh, power and ground aren't shown on there. All right, moving on. So. Um, when you specify the ROM, then you specify rows, columns, and then you have to figure the number of address lines. Uh, remember, the rows are almost always powers of two. Now, programmable logic. I I said the other day when I did that lecture uh, that that we really don't uh, 
that these aren't used that much anymore. But what is used is we have we use a lot of uh, complex programmable logic devices and field programmable gate arrays. So FPGAs and CPLDs. CPLDs are sort of modest size. FPGAs are usually quite large. Uh, now they might not be all that big size-wise because uh, they've shrunk the footprint of these chips by using smaller and smaller feature size and they're now running they're now uh, making chips with 10 nanometer features uh, for uh, for these uh, programmable devices. Uh, Xilinx is one of the biggest companies out there they have about 50 percent of the market I think and this is their, one of their CPLDs. Uh, it has uh, it has these groups of function blocks and each function block has 16 macro cells all the pins on the chip and there can usually be quite a few pins has an I.O. block that allows you to program them as an input or an output to set voltage levels uh, for outputs and inputs and other things um, and then they have this big interconnect matrix and then this functional block so these macro cells uh, often have um, see if I have any uh, no we don't yeah so the macro cells I um, I don't know if we have a good example of a macro cell but let's see no I didn't want to do that um, what I want was this let's do this and we'll do we'll do Bing again and we'll do um, CPLD So let's see if this. Uh, let's do images, maybe. So these are some, and you can see these these chips. They can have quite a few pins on them. There's probably 20 on a side, so this is 20, 40, 60, 80 pins, and uh, and they can implement some pretty some pretty complicated uh, uh, logic. So. So if we look at differences between FPGA and C CPLD, these are some good things. So the uh, CPLD has some, somewhat limited in how much you can, how much stuff you can get on here, but they're very, they're typically, you know, a couple dollars at most, maybe three or four dollars. Whereas FPGAs can can go for a really fancy chip, could go, be in the thousands, a thousand dollars or so. Uh, a little, little more. Uh, they're, they're, they're both can be very fast. The capacity for the CPLD is low and usually just simple applications or maybe use them for glue logic to uh, interface things together. So, okay, so anyway, uh, all right. So, um, an FPGA is just a much more complex, uh, it just has many, many, many more programmable uh, parts to it. Now, typically on the on the in uh, in this on these Xilinx chips, what what you find uh, the programmable parts are you can program the I/O blocks, you can program the interconnect matrix, and then you can program all these macro cells, and uh, and that allows you to to turn this into a, a, just a incredible ver, a range of different logic. So you can basically make this into whatever you want as long as what you want uh, doesn't take more capability than this has. Uh, you can just create your own your own device. That's true with F FPGAs as well. The only difference is, whereas a CPLD might have you know hundreds of these, uh, an FPGA will have hundreds of thousands of these. And you can literally create a tremendous amount of uh, logic on a, on an FPGA. Okay. Well, I think that's kind of really mostly what I wanted to review and cover. Um, so, so, uh, so make sure you review the two lectures that talk about the Quinney McCluskey method, and uh, make sure you're familiar with it, and then just work carefully. You can check your work with a KMAP. Uh, if you do that, you shouldn't screw this up. Uh, so everybody should get a hundred on this quiz. Uh, so take your time. Be prepared before you start it. Don't just jump into it. Make sure you uh, have watched those two lectures. Make sure that then when you start the quiz, you're, you're not going to have to get up and go do something for 20 minutes and then try and come back. 
make sure you're going to stick with it till the end. You do it in one sitting. Uh, you have 90 minutes, so you should have plenty of time to do it. Uh, but don't, um, don't, you know, don't fritter the time away and, and then panic at the end. So watch your time. All right. So if you have any questions or issues, let me know. I promise to do a, a brief session uh, tonight. Uh, I think I said I'd do a little review session at 7.30 tonight. Um, I hope that's what I said. Hmm. So anyway, um, yeah, I think that's right, 7.30. So come at 7.30. Use the same link uh, as, the, uh, as the office hours link on, your, on Blackboard in your course. All right, with that, we will um, we'll, um, stop.